This is The Baseline, discussing the hot button topics of the NBA. Welcome everybody, you're tuned to The Baseline, Cali Warren Shaw, discussing the hot button topics of the NBA. Boy, oh boy, The Baseline NBA podcast is on fleek, and I'm sure the people out in Philadelphia is ringing the bells loud in those streets, man. Big, big, big things happening. Great, great show on tap. Not even going to waste any time. Let me go ahead and roll out the red carpet to my right-hand man, 50 Grand, NBA aficionado, www.shawsports.net, Big Kahuna PNC, my brother from another mother, Mr. Warren Shaw, ripping out of Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Holler back at me, Mr. Shaw. And when I say holler, I'm talking Meek Mill kind of holler. Are you ready to go with this show today? <laughs> Hold up, wait a minute. thought I was finished, Meek Mill. That dude out of jail <laughs> goes right to a game what a life to live man this is a great time to be alive shout out to meek mill and shout out to basketball twitter for for welcoming him back in, in, in a great way um but salute, salute to you and to all the fans listeners of, NBA base, of the nba baseline hope you're enjoying the great playoff action that we've been discussing and that we've been watching on tv yeah definitely also big shout outs to the philadelphia 76ers organization the president um for you know we we often talk about sports but we also talk about how sports is involved in our culture and Meek Mill has been, you know, dragged through this ginormous process with reference to, you know, his um situation um and and you know, criminal justice system, the you know, really the topic being about criminal justice reform. And it, it's interesting. I was just watching on ESPN earlier today um a a show that was kind of depicting the irony. Uh, my apologies. It actually wasn't um it wasn't uh, ESPN. It was actually uh, MSNBC. I think it was Deadline White House. And it was just interesting. They had D.L. Hughley on there. They had a former NBA uh, NFL player on there. And it's just interesting the way that they contrasted how the NBA uh, has fully embraced a lot of the social issues that are tackling that, that we as normal everyday citizens uh, are tackling and even pro athletes and the way that they embrace those social issues in difference to the way that the uh, NFL does. And they used Meek Mill as a as a great example uh, of where the NBA seems to understand how to thread that line, thread that needle. Um, it's not about you know making political statements, but it's about when athletes um, are supporting somebody who is being wronged by something that is happening or making light of a situation regarding certain reform, things that can affect the everyday person and not just the elite. It speaks volumes, and I just really appreciate that the Philadelphia 76ers have acknowledged that. They were supportive of that, and they were also supportive of the athletes who support Meek Mill. And it felt like more of a of a group effort that those in the NBA community actually see what was happening, what was transpiring, and were supportive of that, irrelevant of the fact that it was a closeout game in Philadelphia against the Miami Heat. Well, yeah, I think that's well said. Um, the NBA has consistently done a great job in, in these efforts, so to speak, and then I think there, it doesn't hurt, too, that Philadelphia is a city that it just has a lot of buzz. Brett Brown talked about it, um, just talking about the Eagles winning the World Series, I mean, sorry, the World Series, the Super Bowl, um, Villanova, Villanova and their run in the NCAA tournament, and now their turn now, and then even to just kind of get that added boost with being and having an opportunity to be socially conscious in the, and as well, too, by including Meek Mill in, in their run, in addition to having Kevin Hart as part of their, their celebrity role, so to speak. It just speaks to volumes to what the organization itself and the city of Philadelphia is going through. But like you said, on a larger scale to what the NBA is all about and how they're not afraid. They don't shy away from these types of things. Definitely. So once again, shout outs to the Philadelphia 76ers. And on the flip side of it, our, you know, what we're going to basically be discussing. We got a couple more autopsy reports to drop here in the show. And then a little bit later on, you know, hey, the New Orleans Pelicans felt that they were justified in being in the topic of conversation for the Baseline NBA podcast. They wanted to be the first teams with the Golden State Warriors to step up and have us start previewing their semifinal round matchup in the Western Conference. So that's exactly what we're going to do. So we got a great show on tap. Once, once again, be sure to get at my man Shaw at Shaw Sports NBA. Get at me at Game Face Lee. The show's Twitter handle at NBA Baseline. We're available on all the major platforms. You know where we are. We know how we roll. So we always encourage you download those platforms plug in allow us to be your go-to resource discussing all things happening in the association you know how we do and you know how we roll it's time now for the breakdown time to break it down, you down to the bone gristle. time now for the breakdown cali warren shaw of the baseline nba podcast and main topic of the breakdown yeah man 
Got a few more. We got to body them up. The autopsy report. And we got two teams, obviously. One unceremoniously ousted simply because I picked them to upset the apple cart a little bit. But clearly they showed me that they were incapable of doing that, being the Miami Heat. And one that I think we all knew was happening, even amidst all the enormity and the circumstances that has happened to this basketball team, there's much that we have to discuss with reference to the San Antonio Spurs and where did they go from here. Uh, but they fought the good fight, uh, even though they just didn't have the horses to run with the Golden State Warriors, who basically ousted them in a gentleman's sweep. Um, and much like both of these teams, Shaw, gentlemen sweeps across the board. But clearly our main focus is on the Philadelphia 76ers ousting the Miami Heat. The Miami Heat getting knocked off in in you know in in five in four games, essentially. I just it's just interesting when you think about this Miami Heat team, Shaw. They seem to have showed a lot more getting themselves into the playoffs than I thought they were capable of showing me in what we wanted to see from them uh, in this series against the 76ers? Well, I think it, they acquitted themselves all right for what they had, you know, at the end of the day. I think it was David Griffin. You know, he's a great, great guy. I'd love to have him on our show one time. Where he was saying kind of post-game analysis is like, listen, once the Heat understood the talent level was just too disparaging for them to overcome, then they wanted to make it a street fight, and they did try to muck it up and try to bully Philadelphia, and hoping that would be an angle that would be able to take them out of their game, so to speak. And I think that all stems from the veteran guys on that roster, like Dwayne Wade and even Udonis Haslam on, on the bench. Um, it was like, listen, well, here's what we can potentially do. Let's get into them, um, maybe make it a more physical, slow things down a little bit, so maybe we can can have a chance and in the first half of every game why well, I mean, he played great basketball um just the second half of the games weren't always such didn't uh, yield the same results so i think miami did okay overall so yeah i want to all right so i want to touch on two things that you said shaw and then i'm going to raise a question to you i completely agree with you maybe somewhere they had a looking mirror they had some sort of a realization um and in, in saying that maybe they just weren't as talented as the philadelphia 76ers but isn't it crazy how we talk so highly about how dangerous this Miami Heat team would be um, that if they were to make the playoffs, that they would be a problem for anyone that they were playing against. So now I guess the question that I really have is, are we talking about how much more talented this Philadelphia 76ers team truly is? Or are we talking less about how we fooled ourselves in thinking that this Miami Heat team really is? can be a talented basketball because it's not like we're talking about a bunch of old farts that are playing with the Miami Heat. You got some really good, solid young pieces. And then you also have some wily veterans. I mean, we could, you know, we don't have generational type players, right, on the Miami Heat team yet, right? So I agree to that point. But how do we get to this to this point where we're saying, wow, the Miami Heat just didn't, they just not talented enough. Like if they were to do this year after year, it will always be the Philadelphia 76ers that's going to best the Miami Heat. How, how do we get to that particular point with this team? Well, I think from a playoff standpoint, what, what it boils down to, and we said this in some of our previews too, is like you just need to have an in, in innate ability to score. Great defenses. It's all fine and good, and you need that to be part of the game too, but you have to be able to score. And Miami doesn't have true scorers. They don't have an elite basketball player on that roster anymore and mm -hmm. somebody that is the, the clear go-to guy. And that's the thing that, that – stood out more than anything else against this, this Philadelphia 76ers roster from a talent standpoint. I feel like if this was, I don't know, I, I think, think of maybe, well, because I, 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 I value Chris Middleton pretty highly per se, but think about it versus the Bucks, so to speak, where Giannis is the clear star. All right, cool. There's somebody that you can kind of rally around when you need a basket, and then everybody else is going to kind of fill, fill the role. Then maybe that would have given you a better chance if Milwaukee played defense and were coached in the way that the Miami Heat were. Um, I think that would have maybe posed a tougher challenge for Philadelphia overall and maybe extended the series a little bit longer. But I didn't have too many delusions about thinking Miami was going to win the series. I said, hey, Philadelphia is going to probably win it in six. They ended up doing it in five. And again, it, it, they were still five hard-fought games, even though some of the scores don't even, even in, indicate that. Uh, but overall, Miami just didn't have the overall offense uh, to, to really battle Philadelphia on a regular basis. And then, again, 
not to belabor something we were talking about on our previous show, but when you have guys like Whiteside kind of shrinking in the moment, you know, on, on the larger stage, that doesn't help either. And then you just don't have enough guys to kind of uh, give them the firepower that they needed. All right, so then let's go ahead and dive. I mean, you know, why why not belabor the point? I mean, we're actually, we got shovels in hand and we're digging a ditch for the Miami Heat, right? This is the autopsy report that we're talking about. So let's go ahead and start digging that ditch because to your point, Shaw, what we're basically saying is, is that the Miami Heat needs to retweak this roster to enable themselves to score the basketball a lot more consistently than what's obviously failed them in the course of this particular series. Now, let's not get it twisted. We're ultimately we're also ultimately saying that Hassan Whiteside might not be that dude, right? Like, you know, there was a time when we could have said Dwight Howard could be that guy. And he showed that with the Orlando Magic. We could question how the ball was distributed to him by Stan Van Gundy and the style of offense that he was embedded in. But there was no question that when we saw in waning moments when the Orlando Magic crucially needed to change their game plan, they relied on Dwight Howard trying to score the basketball, punishing the paint. I, to me, it's very clear that the Miami Heat or Eric Spolster, or however you want to slice it, have not instilled a level of that confidence that they're going to rely on Hassan Whiteside the same way that the Philadelphia 76ers would rely on Joel Embiid. And so to me, that to me is part of the problem that we're going to see with this Miami Heat team because what do you do with this roster if you still haven't figured out who is your your who is your next D Wade, right? Like you who's going to take over Wade County? Who's going to take over the construction of the Miami Heat organization beyond the the Dwayne Wade uh the Dwayne Wade era? Cap strapped. There is no movement for them any way, in any way, shape, or form. Or that is, there's no magical elixir that they're going to be able to 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 drink now and get somebody on this roster that's going to be able to help them. And then even from a, a talent standpoint, where as some teams you look and say, all right, well they have these young guys, and maybe these young guys can develop and maybe can kind of become something. That's not that's not where they're at. Um, Josh Richardson, as good as he is. He is who he is. And next year is the first year of his new deal that's where he's going to be that, making. That, that's almost had like a nice Shakespearean kind of feel to it. No matter who, what he is, he is who he is. <laughs> but what, what more do you, do you expect Josh Richardson, even at 24 years old now and going to be 25, do you think he's going to develop into some 20, 20 point per game guru who's going to shoot 45% from three or something like that? Like, what are we talking about here? You know, and then even Bam out of Bayou. Yeah. Nice young kid, but is he going to develop into that, you know, next year when they owe already $147 million in cap space already eaten up? And that's without Wade um, Hazem, I think, should be retiring at this at this stage. And that's without Wayne Ellington, who was their best three-point marksman, the best three-point marksman off the bench in NBA history in terms of made threes. Um, so for me, this team is, is very, very much stuck, you know, kind of in a time warp, so to speak. And unless it takes some some – uh, maneuvering and shaking from the the great Pat Riley, and he's all, he's able to offload some of these contracts uh, for young guys or picks or something of that some that nature. I don't see how this team isn't going to be better, and I think they can be they can be exactly what they were this year. You know, a five six seed getting in there, and and, and it can be gritty, win forty two games or so, and and get into the playoffs. But they're not they don't have championship aspirations with this roster. All right, well you mentioned it, Shaw. So this is a cap strap basketball team. So let's kind of quickly go through this 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 roster real quick and you have to say at some particular point we can sit here and say you know this team is strapped financially uh this team doesn't have a young, enough young players this team has uh you know doesn't have enough veterans whatever if if what we're saying is you got to work with what you have then let's look at what they have and tell me who can they work with to get to a point to at least help facilitate what is clearly sorely lacking, right? No, I'm serious. Because what you're also saying to me is you whiffed on Justice Winslow, right? Like, yep, it wasn't, yeah, okay. So you whiffed on Justice Winslow. Um, you you have Kelly Olynyk, right? Kelly, Kelly, Kelly Olynyk was a great three-point shooter, at least from what I saw when he was playing with the Boston Celtics. Even though he's a liability from a defensive end, he still was used a, a lot better in many respects than maybe what Eric Spolster was using Kelly Olynyk as. Or maybe he just doesn't vibe well with Hassan Whiteside, right? Goran Dragic. Goran Dragic at some point, I guess, was supposed to be like their Steve Nash on that basketball team, right? Or are you asking him to be a primary scorer for that basketball team? Because if you're saying that you want him to be a primary distributor, that means the rest of these guys got to go out there and get you buckets. So who on this roster do you see Eric Spolstra and that staff developing 
to be something more than clearly what was lacking, not just in the series, but what we've been saying is in the moniker about the demise about the Miami Heat always contending in the playoffs or in the regular season and the lack of scoring consistency. I'm going to go ahead and uh, give you a one-way ticket to Waiters Island. Um, at this stage, we I mean, it's easy to forget that Deion Waiters is on this roster because he's had the ankle injuries over the last two years. And I, I'm going to say this very bluntly. If Deion Waiters has to be their best player, I don't know how much of a ceiling more than they what they've shown already is going to happen. But we know for sure he'll be that guy who's ready and willing to take shots and to try to make shots in the clutch um, when, when the playoffs do to, to come around. So he's 26 years old. But when you're looking at a guy like Goran Dragic, he's 31. Like, I don't see him developing in, into anything greater right now. Now, again, I already talked about Josh Richardson at 24, but it's hard to see him being a guy that's going to really, really take another leap offensively. Again, he's, he's, he's a slasher and he can, he can spot up, but he's not a great player. Uh, he's not a great playmaker off the dribble and he can't get his own shot in, in, in that way. Then again, it goes back to Bam Adebayo. And then as you mentioned to Justice Winslow, does Winslow take some sort of leap? Now I expect Winslow to at least try to next year because, hey, guess what? It's his contract year. So he's going to want to try to get that money from Pat Riley. So yeah, he might try to like all of a sudden have a like little push where he averages 14 a game now. And you say, oh, well, now we're seeing the things start to develop with him. Um, I guess for, for, for if you're the Miami Heat, you're hoping and praying that it's going to be Winslow and he develops some sort of a shot. But the guy who's most ready and willing to and can still have a little bit more developmental um, growth within his NBA career is Waiters because he's only 26 years old. Um, I think he does have a lot to prove. But again, I, I, don't, I don't want to be banking on that if I'm a Heat fan or the Heat organization. All right, what about Tyler Johnson? No. So, <laughs> no. <laughs> I mean, I don't care that he makes $19 million or I whatever mean, but he, it is. But he, but he does have that nice, you know what I'm saying, that Ricky Rose kind of – Weird thing going on. I mean, it, no, it doesn't play. Right. All right. Oh, well, but then, so then, here, here is my question, and maybe this is something to the point about what happened in the playoffs, because I, you know, and and I'm not saying that I was completely intently focusing on what was happening between the Miami Heat and the Philadelphia 76ers, but did it not weird you out a little bit not to see Justice Winslow and Josh Richardson on the basketball court at the same time? Like to me, I I almost feel like maybe Eric Spolstra is canceling out some of the some of the potential of what he could get moving forward if he's not playing these guys um, in some level of frequency. To, to, to your point, if you're not buying into Tyler Johnson as the true two, two guard, so to speak, for this, this basketball team, then why not have Josh Richardson at that two spot? And why not have Justice Winslow at that three spot? And, 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 and I get it. A lot of this is because Deion Waiters is not there, and clearly if he was, you know, it would change the dynamic of this because we'd probably be saying Deion Waiters would be the starting two, right? And so then what do you still do? I still believe, though, that you got to figure out what to do with Josh Richardson is equally you would need to figure out what you would do with Deion Waiters. If you're going to make Waiters the primary scorer, I still think you got to get something out of Josh Richardson because essentially – two of your younger, more talented basketball players that has at least shown some level of de- of consistency to be dependent upon. Because I don't know yeah. if you're going to get that with Justice Winslow at this particular point. You've moved him to the four, you've moved him to the three, you've moved him to the two, and now you he's ultimately all of that on the bench, but not someone that you start with some level of confidence. Yeah, it's tough. I mean, Richardson and Winslow had some time on the four together, as you alluded to. Winslow played a lot of four. Um, a lot of force specifically even in, in the series against Philadelphia. Um, I remember in the playoffs, uh, not the playoffs, um, or a year ago or so, well, like Winslow was playing even some small ball five at, at times as Spolster was just trying to figure out, you know, what the seat roster could look like and w- what they would be able to do. Um, again, you have to hope he's the one that, that, that develops. I'm not confident and I'm not willing to, you know, to, to, to bet my money, you know, that he's going to develop. But I think when it comes to the combination of Winslow and Richardson, they can be a nice duo, uh, but they're at this point they're they're good, maybe even really good rotation players, but they're not stars, and that's what Miami needs. They need a star on this roster. Elephant question in the room, Shaw: Do you think D Wade retires at the at the um, uh, before the beginning of the season, before the start of the season? Well, I I get the sense that there's a very strong possibility of it, and you know, not to be dodgy, um, but the the LeBron factor in some ways is still kind of always looming. And I really do believe that LeBron at some point is going to try to get all of his homies to play together on one squad so he can get Chris Paul and Carmelo and Wade and all that. The only way that that happens is if he goes to Houston. 
Yeah, well, I mean, it can happen one way or another. I mean, depending depending on the roster, because you know, if if LeBron says he's coming to any team, they're going to shed whatever they need to do to make it happen. Um, so I think you know that's a possibility where Wade could could definitely return. Um, I feel I feel like I'll say this. I'll parse it this way: if LeBron is unable to kind of figure out a situation where they can all get together, uh, Wade probably lets it go. Or if he does come back, he plays one more year, then he retires and doesn't even try to get into that whole banana boat situation altogether. Um, I still feel like he feels like he has something to give with this team and this roster, but he may want to see what Raleigh is going to do um, in trying to figure out the futures of the James Johnson, the James Johnsons, the white sides of the world, and the rest of this team um, before he makes an ultimate decision. All right, you're tuned to The Baseline. Callie Warren Shaw discussing the hot-button topics of the NBA. Subject of the breakdown, autopsy report. Just finished bodying up the Miami Heat. Impressive season. They did, you know, make it into the playoffs. Uh, they they made it in as the, um, as the sixth seed. However, they got ousted by the Philadelphia 76ers quite handily, uh, even though they made it a tough series uh, in each of those games. Uh, they only were able to amass one win uh, out of the four. All right, so let's go ahead and switch gears, and we got another one, man. I, I feel like we're we're serial. It's like we're serial killers right now, uh, with the way that we're gonna what have. What do you mean? To do- we didn't we didn't kill them. We just zipping them up. We, we just zip- <laughs> we're seeing how they got killed. I, my apologies. We are the cleaners. We're the cleaners right now, exactly. so we got to do some additional cleaning. <laughs> got to do some additional cleaning, and that being the San Antonio Spurs. And I, I know. Listen, I almost feel like the San Antonio Spurs were were walking you know, into the lion's den, essentially. The worst possible matchup you could ask for when you don't have literally your best player on the basketball court, which is being Kawhi Leonard. But a lot of good things did come from this experience the San Antonio Spurs had getting into the playoffs. And albeit that they 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 they, they did lose in four in, in four games to the Golden State Warriors, a lot could be said about the way that the San Antonio Spurs played. And despite you know what happened with Popovich and his um, and his wife, uh, with all of the stuff that was circ- circling the San Antonio Spurs show, I do think that there are some really good things you can take from the experience and this season that the San Antonio Spurs had, and it starts with Lamarcus Aldridge. Yeah, LMA really found himself again, and has proven to be he can be somebody that uh, you rely on and he can carry a team to to the playoffs. And while he did have some trips and, and slips here and there trying to get into the postseason. They ultimately got there and you know, were able to capture one game against the Golden State Warriors and um, acquitted themselves as well. It's, it's just too, just like the case of the Miami Heat, just outgunned, outmatched, you know, and somebody had asked me why I said the Spurs were losing five. It's like, oh, well, don't you believe in the Spurs lore and everything like that? And, and I do, but there's just realism that is kind of set in with the team in this roster. And, and without Kawhi there, they too had nobody else to help them score the basketball. A uh, very just a common theme in in this playoffs, especially with the teams that have, that have been ousted. Um, you've got to find a way to diversify your offense, and LMA was the only really truly bright spot on this roster in the playoffs, if you will. But throughout the year, you had the development of Deontay Murray, and I think that was that was massive. Um, you got some nice minutes there as well too from from Kyle Anderson here and there at 24 years old, playing some small forward, but not consistent enough, and not quite the guy that they they hoped he'd, he'd develop into. Um, Rudy Gay. Did have a pretty good season. Um, you know, he was still injured on and off here too, but uh, still played well enough for them in the role that he had. So there are some some positive things, and you feel like, damn, if Kawhi was here, what could have been? But he wasn't. And now we're talking about the Spurs with all kinds of questions, including Mono Ginobili, including Tony Parker, you know, even Pau Gasol. You know, do all of those guys come back? Gasol has a lot of money left on the table, so there's it's probably not a no-brainer that he's coming back. Um, but with the rest of them, it, there is no guarantee um, and they're not quite in the same rough cap situation that we've talked about with other teams that we've done our autopsy report in. But still, is this an attractive market for for this team and this roster for other players to want to come to? Well, I want to pose an interesting question to you, Shaw. Do you think that with this San Antonio Spurs team that this is about the maturation of some of the talent that they've had over the last couple of years? The Kyle Andersons, the Davis Bertans, uh, Bryn Forbes. Uh, is it about the development of those guys uh, to kind of carry the torch or should this be a San Antonio Spurs team that does what they did? Like they got a key acquisition. They rolled a dice on a guy like Rudy Gay injury prone type player, but when healthy, I mean, look at the results of what he basically gave you. And if the idea is that Kawhi Leonard does come back 
Um, and he and and you know they're all good. Like this relationship with him and the organization is at least good enough to to get them to equate what they're trying to do this season, get in the playoffs and be a threat. How much of this experience do you think now rests on the idea that they should do free agency, or how much it should be about Popovich continuing to coach up these young players? They believe in their process, and you know you have to give the Spurs credit. That sounded that. so political. Uh, <laughs> No, I'm just I, saying. I'm, gonna, I'm not. I'm not trying to disrespect you. I'm just saying that that sounded very political. It's seen. It, it's. It sounds like. It sounds like you're hedging your bets. Well, they'll do a little of this, and maybe they'll do a little of that. No, no, I'm not hedging at all. Again, they believe in their process. Mm-hmm. I don't. Um, I think it's 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 proven and it's tried and it's true. But I think that was with a different era and a different ilk of of players on the roster, where you still had some really truly elite guys who were able to kind of build off and 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 teach them the way. LaMarcus and Kawhi, for all intents and purposes, all, all accounts say like they're not great leaders. They're not great locker room chemistry guys when it comes to that. I, well, they're not, I, they're I not would, locker room killers, I'll but they don't up, help I'll young guys you on that. I don't know if whether or not those two are good together. I, 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 I'm, I, listen, I think Kawhi Leonard is, trans, is a generational talent. I think LaMarcus Aldridge, I don't want to use the word generational talent, but definitely among one of the best power forwards in the game of basketball right now, right? Um, but those two guys together, I, I, I've yet to have seen where they cohesively look as legitimately the type of threat that I think maybe they envisioned when they brought LaMarcus Aldridge over um, from Portland. Right. I mean, I mean, I think that is the elephant in the room where it comes to LMA because he had his best season in years when Kawhi didn't play. And so I think we never really got to see, okay, well, what happened if Kawhi was fully back? Could they still get this same level of production out of LaMarcus? And, and we didn't see that this year because we Kawhi wasn't, wasn't there. And now there's a very distinct and real possibility that Kawhi may not be there uh, moving forward. Um, but at the end of the day, these are two guys, while they are elite-level talents, um, they don't seem to do a whole lot for, for – um, uh, furthering the culture of, of the Spurs roster altogether. And that's all stemming from Pop and R.C. Buford at the top. They're going to have to be the ones to kind of pervade that culture. And, and I don't know if they have the time, energy, and, and, and equity um, to do that, especially with the current current players. And that's when you say, okay, well, what do we expect Bryn Forms and Brandon Paul and those types of players to really develop into? With a different level of, of, of elite talent on the roster or superstars, maybe they could be a little bit more and they can really just kind of, you know, plug and play like the Spurs have done for many years. Um, but without that kind of leadership at the top in terms of the players, I think that's harder for them to develop you know, at the coaching level and even at the player development level. So I'm very, very skeptical about what the Spurs future is. So, so, so in, in a way, are we questioning the foundation of rebuilding the Spurs dynasty? Like, I've often felt that over the years, it's been built off of knowing that the foundation has been Tony Parker, Manu Ginobili, and Tim Duncan. Now, in the year, you know, in their in their championship year, Shaw, you plugged in Kawhi Leonard, and essentially, you had a three year period where you could you could have said, "Hey, the San Antonio Spurs probably could have found themselves playing in NBA." you know, winning NBA championships, maybe two of those three years, you can probably make an argument had they not, you know, been sustainable with the injuries to Tim Duncan, that they probably could have had a much better look in that that final year, so to speak, in that three-year window. And I guess what I'm saying is, is that they did a really good job when they were losing pieces to replace the pieces. Are we basically saying that altogether that the foundation that's been holding this thing up is utterly cracked and that no matter, even if you put Kawhi Leonard back in there, even if you replace LaMarcus Aldridge because they can't get along, that the foundation has so much uncertainty that you don't know what to build on top of it because of that? Yeah, I mean, I think that's fair overall. Um, you would have to, you know, put some qualifiers in there, you know, to, to kind of clean it up some, at least for me. But at the end of the day, yeah, uh, this is not the same San Antonio Spurs that they were four or five years ago uh, because their superstars have changed. Um, their coaching to some degree has changed in terms of even Popovich. He's had to change a little bit of the way that he's used to be because his stars are also different. Um, and then the, the plug and play pieces don't really seem to plug and play at the same elite level that they used to. Um, even Danny Green at this stage of his career right now, um, really not really doing a whole lot for this team. And he has a player option. So, you know, chances are he's going to be back. You know, what do they do? Where do they go? And they just, and again, they haven't been historically 
a destination spot for free agents. And there's not, I think, a lot of guys that are looking that way this 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 summer. Now, again, if magically, you know, something happens, Popovich gets in LeBron's ear and he says, hey, I want to come to the come to this team. And then, hey, LeBron is in, in San Antonio. Then it's a different ball game. You know, and I think you got to give the Spurs a certain level of credence and a certain level of the benefit of the doubt because they've always seemed to have bounced back. And a lot of it is just going to depend what happens with Kawhi. But I'm not ready to write them totally off, but all the signs are there in terms of a team and a roster that has to go in a different direction. All right, this is a team that finished 12 games above 500, right? And this is the first time in a gazillion years that they didn't eclipse a 50-win season. Look, automatically Kawhi Leonard comes back on this team. You're you're in the high 40s, right? Easy should be in the 50s if you're keeping the same roster that you have. But it's likely that they're going to change things up. If you were a betting man, where do you think that they should look to change and improve this roster? What positions? Shooting guard. Um, shooting guard, first and foremost. They've, they've, they've got to sure that up. Um, and, and somebody who can really uh, truly be uh, a, a scoring type guard. Green is a 3 and D type guy. And you can argue that the three part of it is really not as sexy as it used to be. Um, but I think if they can get another elite level guy who can score, you know, from the perimeter or even slash to some degree and, and get in the lane, you know, that will help them tremendously from an offensive side of the standpoint with or without Kawhi, obviously with would be better. Um, but they just need to find some way to get some more uh, real scoring. Um, that's not just kind of in the, in the mold of Danny Green or the Patty Mills, you know, kind of an undersized point guard. Like th that, that stuff just isn't going to work for them moving forward in today's NBA. They need to get like a big guy, a big guard who can shoot it and can score it um, on both sides. All right. Well, there you have it. The San Antonio Spurs basketball team that has been always in the conversation amongst the best teams in the NBA. Uh, certainly didn't things didn't work this way for them this season, but they found themselves in the playoffs and they were just not not good enough uh, to be able to to hold their own against a team like the Golden State Warriors. So now we pose the question, what do you do now if you're the San Antonio Spurs? Can you mend the relationship with Kawhi Leonard? Is LaMarcus Aldridge comfortable finally in his own skin? And can those two superpowers coexist under the tutelage of Greg Popovich? There's a lot of questions that have to be asked. And there's a, certainly a lot of uh, questions that have to be answered about this team moving forward. But one thing we can definitely say, the San Antonio Spurs will still be a formidable basketball team for this upcoming season. So while we have to zip them up, which normally we don't do until they get to some sort of conference finals or semifinals matchup, for now, we're just going to kind of put them asunder, so to speak. Hopefully they will rise up from the dead. And uh, become and become the, the the force that we have always come to know. And zip them up, put them on the incinerator. <laughs> You're already cremating this team, man. I mean, this, well, this... then they can rise from the ashes. Like, yeah. how about that? <laughs> uh, I can see somebody's geared up for Infinity War. <laughs> Uh, you know it, you know it, brother. You know it, you know it. <laughs> you're, you're tuned to the baseline. Cali, Warren Shaw discussing the hot button topics of the NBA. And this was the breakdown. Drop, 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 drop. Time now for the drop. Cali, Warren Shaw, the baseline NBA podcast. And this week on the drop, NBA playoff preview time, baby, for this first semifinals. Listen, the Golden State Warriors were like, look, we're just going to be up and done with the San Antonio Spurs stuff, right? Like, we're just done with it. What we weren't expecting is for the New Orleans Pelicans to just say we were going to be up and done with the Blazers. I mean, the Pelicans, aside from sweeping the Blazers, they basically have now relit this process in our heads about us truly doing a preview in the semifinals, right? Like we would say, oh, if this was the Blazers, the Blazers will probably get a game or two, maybe depending on what happens to Steph Curry. And, you know, but we know that the Warriors are walking to the finals. After what the Pelicans have done, Shaw, they literally have resurrected our importance of doing previews <laughs> in the next round. Like we really need to have a preview about the Pelicans versus the Golden State Warriors. Yeah, 100 percent, you know, and they kind of threw off the timing for everything else, too. I'm sure for the NBA in terms of their scheduling and how they wanted games to run over the course of the weekend and such. But nevertheless, you know, the Pelicans did their job. They got it done. They didn't waste time and they dispatched the Blazers in 
um, embarrassing fashion. And now their reward is the Golden State Warriors. And it looks like they're going to be pretty lucky where Curry is still not anticipated to be back, at least for the first couple games of this series, uh, which, is, which should give Portland, Portland, give New Orleans um, an opportunity to really be competitive, you know, from, from the outset and to maybe put a little bit of doubt, you know, especially if they can steal one of the first two games on the road against Golden State, um, you know, that can maybe make Curry want to rush back, so to speak, just to ensure and to feel safe. Now, again, I don't subscribe to the notion that the Warriors get scared or they panic or anything like that. Um, but I think there is a little bit of, of, of vulnerability that, that they don't necessarily want to um, uh, acknowledge on their behalf. Um, because they they do need stuff if they're going to try to win it all. And there's a lot of conversation on their end, like, oh, well, you know, hey, we'd love to have them, but, you know, we can do it without them. I don't know that that's the case, and New Orleans might be primed for the taking if they can get in there and, and steal one of the first two games. There's so many ways that we can go about doing this, Shaw. It's kind of crazy, but I, I, I'm going to start off with this. You remember how I kept saying before that, you know, one of the reasons why I'm always going to pick the Golden State Warriors to be the better team uh, whether it's a team that's you know led by LeBron James or even let's say the Houston Rockets, is because they don't have a matchup for arguably the the one person who is non matchable, which is Kevin Durant, right? Like how do you how do you consistently defend for forty eight minutes if that's you know what we're saying that a guy's on the floor doing? How do you defend a guy who is seven foot that shoots the three? that drives to the basket, that shoots at a high clip from the three-point line, that shoots at a high clip from, you know, from, uh, from the interior, that shoots like 90% from the free throw line. Like, you can't defend that. But now, with what I've been seeing with this New Orleans Pelicans team, I understand it's only a four-game sample of what they did against the Portland Trailblazers, but there's something different about Anthony Davis. There's, there's an element to Anthony Davis that I don't even think that even he saw within himself four years ago when he made the playoffs as an eight seed and the Golden State Warriors were the one seed, right? There's something different about Anthony Davis. Maybe he feels a lot more confident playing next to Drew Holiday. He has, you know, playoff Rondo next to him. But I can, you can actually start making an argument that Kevin, that, that Anthony Davis might actually be the one matchup that the Golden State Warriors can't account for, even if they have Steph Curry on the floor, if this is the Anthony Davis that's going to be playing in the second round of this NBA playoffs. Anthony Davis does not see the Golden State Warriors defense at all. So you, he's you not worried saying? about that. Like yeah, he, like he, a, he actually thwarts the idea that playing small might actually do you more harm than good. Like, the system of what the Warriors did, everyone else in the NBA decided to mimic and mock, play small ball, run up and down the court. This might not actually be a good thing if you're the Golden State Warriors because you don't have the, 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 the true rebounding physical force unless Draymond Green steps it up. And, and doing that means he got to mentally stay focused, can't get into foul trouble. I don't know how you still can match that for 48 minutes if this is the kind of Anthony Davis that the, the Warriors are going to be up against in this next round. Well, they'll definitely give him different looks. Um, you'll see you'll see Durant on him. You'll see Draymond on him. You may even see Iguodal on him at times as well, too, and trying to force Davis to— Shaw, it may come down to Zaza Pachulia trying to, you know, trying to step trying to step on an ankle, bro. Trying to foul somebody and it, get somebody injured. Yeah, I mean, you know, there's, I don't think the Warriors are above those— um, bullying tactics, <laughs> so to speak. You, you know, know, I don't put anything why, past anybody. Why you got to make uh, him seem so grimy, man? That's not what I meant. I don't. I, I'm, I'm no, only. I'm only. I, I was <laughs> only focused on Zaza. That's it. I was only focused on yeah. Zaza. We 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 ain't trying to listen. Draymond's kicking days are. I think they're long over. I think they're long gone. I think he respects AD a little little too much to to, to go yeah. that route. There's there's definitely love there, and I think there's even a respect for obviously their old assistant coach Canelo Gentry as well too. Um, but again, you know, to the point, Davis is not fearful of of the defense that Golden State is going to throw at them um, one way or the other. So again, he'll see some different looks throughout the series. The key really is going to be what what happens to does playoff Rondo still average nearly a triple double? Does Drew Holiday still average nearly 30 points a game? You know, with this level of defense, does New Orleans defense now? kick it into gear, um, where you where Lillard and McCollum, they are containable because they, they don't rely on a whole lot of ball movement. They do a lot of their scoring off isolation, you know, at the top and at the wings. 
um, where Golden State is going to be moving the ball and multiple people are going to get touches as they look for the best shot. And that's going to leave guys like Clay open and, and Durant open, you know, in certain situations. So Portland, Portland, I keep saying that, uh, the Pelicans have to figure out a way uh, to, to figure out their defense um, and, and how they're going to keep their rotations tight. And this is where Meritage, who he was trying so hard defensively in, in, that, in that Portland series. And, and I, I give so much kudos to him. But Durant is a different animal. You know what I mean? So do, do they give Durant Meritage sometimes on Durant? Or does he try to stick with, with, with Draymond, so to speak, and get a little bit of break so he can, quote, unquote, be the help man and let Draymond shoot threes and try to, try to beat you that way? Uh, I'm really interested to see what New Orleans' defense is going to be like more than anything else because I'm not too concerned about Anthony Davis scoring and even some of the other offensive guys that they have on the team. Well, I definitely will say this, and this is on the side of the Golden State Warriors because you know we're talking at length more about what the Pelicans are going to need to do to win this series. And as part of that, obviously, we're assuming that the Golden State Warriors are going to win this series. But I really do think that in order for the Golden State Warriors to win this series, Draymond Green has to be more ag- more aggressive. Um, you just made a mention of the fact that, you know, Draymond may shoot the three, may space, extend the floor more, stretch Meritich out. And I think the only way that you're going to be able to really do that, Draymond Green cannot be hesitant about giving the rock up because he knows he's got Kevin Durant and he, he's got Klay Thompson. I believe that the way Alvin Gentry sees this is he wants Draymond Green to be Mr. Everything offensively. That means that they want him to take the shot. And most times when the Warriors turn the ball over, it's because they overthink or they try to be too fancy or they do too damn much, right? To quote the Jamel Hill, Mike Smith moniker, right? They do too damn much. I think that if you're Draymond Green, you need to make them pay. And that means that they need 2016, 17 Draymond Green on the basketball court. They can't have this type of Draymond Green who's throwing the ball all over the place because he just thinks that he can figure out a way to get the ball to Durant and Thompson. I think that the the, the Pelicans are going to hone in on those guys defensively, and they're going to try and smother them, even cause some trapping double teams happening over there. And that means that they're going to leave it open for Draymond to decide to shoot that three. He's got to shoot that three. Yeah, he's got to be confident. There's no doubt about it. And if I'm Alvin Gentry and the Pelicans, like I said, that's what I'm doing. I'm going to try to make Draymond, you know, be a 17 to 20 point per game type of guy and see how many shots it takes him to, 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 to kind of get that. Draymond is best when he's out there just kind of moving around and, and, and operating in some space and, you know, making cuts kind of unbothered, so to speak. He averaged eight assists in that, in that, again, in that first series. Um, you know, again, almost himself averaging a triple-double. So to me, Draymond is a guy that you want to try to have, have you beat you or even Iguodala when he's out there in whatever minutes that, that, that he's playing. Uh, you got to stay attached to Durant, obviously, as best you can. He's still going to kill you and still get his points, too. Um, but you got to shut the things off for, for guys like Clay Thompson so that they don't get going, especially in that building in Golden State and Oracle. Once that crowd gets into it, that's that's a whole different animal in the, that of itself as well, too. Um, but New Orleans, because they, they went through and dispatched Portland in the way they did, um, I think they have a little bit more confidence, a little bit more swag, and they should be a little bit more respected than I'm seeing thus far in terms of what their chances are. Now, again, do I think they can win? That, yeah, that's a long shot. Uh, but I think they're going to be extremely competitive and give Golden State all the hell they can handle. All right, Shaw. So who do you see being the X factor for the New Orleans Pelicans? Who do you see as being your X factor for the Golden State Warriors? Well, I'm going to go out on, on a pseudo limb. I think, you know, there's certain things that are obvious when it comes to New Orleans. Like Davis has to play well. Holiday still has to play at the level that he was. And Meritage needs to do what he does as well as Rondo. Um, but I'm going to be looking for the for the overall bench of New Orleans. I think that is a huge factor for them um, because if if the Pelicans need to have their starters playing 40 minutes a night just to keep up with all the guns that Golden State throws at them on a regular basis, that can wear wear on them throughout the throughout the series. Now, granted, you know the first couple of games they're coming into Game One with a lot of rest, so they should be in good shape for that. Uh, but overall, that bench somebody needs to come up, come in and step up, or one way or the other, it's somebody different every night. So whether that's Ian Clark, Darius Miller, Solomon Hill. Um, you know, even DeAndre Liggins, if he gets out there at all, which I don't think he will. Um, but those are the guys I'm looking like, hey, come out there. Give us some, give us, you know, 10 points, you know what I mean, and shoot 50% and knock down a couple threes. And I think those, that will be help uh, New Orleans mitigate some of, the, some of the, uh, the, 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 the minutes that the starters aren't playing out there when they're going, going up against Golden State. Uh, the, New Orleans, the New Orleans Pelicans defense, I think, needs to be the X factor. 
Um, and part of that is also going to come down to Rajon Rondo and, and how he plays the backcourt uh, for New Orleans uh, against the Golden State Warriors. You know, part of the reason why the Golden State Warriors um, have always been a basketball team that you admire, but at the same time you almost bite your fingernails with is because of their propensity to turn the ball over. Um, ultimately, you have a, a relatively uh, young backcourt, right? When you've got, you know, Quinn Cook taking the ball at times, um, even to some degree, Andre Iguodala. Um, he, you know, he's not a true point, but they run him at the point uh, position because they obviously want to run, you know, uh, run uh, screens off for for Clay Thompson to get open and shoot shots. So I believe that the New Orleans Pelicans defensively, who sh were really impressive in that series against the Portland Trailblazers, they basically stymied the most lethal backcourt combination, who I thought was going to do some heavy damage in the first round of the NBA playoffs between with Damian Lillard and CJ McCollum. If the Pelicans can continue to force the Golden State Warriors to struggle to find their shot or to be overly dependent on Kevin Durant to bail them out at times when they go into their scoring droughts, that is then going to force them to have to start playing better defense to accentuate how offensively gifted the New Orleans Pelicans are. Right now in the playoffs, the New Orleans Pelicans are the highest scoring team um, of the of the uh, of the teams in the NBA playoffs, so that could bold well if they continue to find their groove offensively. If you're the Golden State Warriors, to me, it's really going to come down to Clay Thompson. Clay Thompson, to me, has to punish Drew Holiday offensively, make him work defensively, and to do that, you got to run him around, and you got to either get him in foul trouble or you got to get him thinking more about handling Klay Thompson from a defensive perspective. And it may come to the point, show where Rajon might actually have to take Klay Thompson instead of Drew Holiday because Gentry might look for Drew Holiday to be more of the scorer that he showed us that he's capable of being in the first round of the series. So those those two guys, to me, um, are, are those two keys, to sort of speak, are my X factors for the series. Now that makes a lot of sense, really, really and truly, especially in the case of Rondo. Um, I think Rondo has the ability to make sure that he stays attached to Klay and if they force Clay to rely more on his post-up game, I think he's capable. But I, I'd, I'd be more comfortable with that than him out there kind of bombing threes on us. You know, and, and those are the type of things that get the crowd hype as well, too. Um, so I, I agree with that strategy. And from the Golden State side of things, you know, it's, it's hard when you have the talent that they have. You're like, okay, well, who's the X factor type of, type of situation? But ex ex especially while Clay, sorry, while, while Curry is out. Um, I think it is Iguodala and whatever minutes he goes out there. Um, does he get them into their offense um, a little bit, or do they just continue to try to rely on Draymond and Kevin Durant, you know, for for that role? Um, if Iguodala is playing at a, at a high level uh, on both sides, and again, not that he's going to be scoring, you know, a, a whole bunch of points, but you get, if he can get double digit points, you know, four or five, four or five rebounds, four or five assists, um, and, and just kind of doing his job and being irritant deflections and things of that nature, that's going to be huge for for Golden State overall. Because um, I don't think I'm. I'm I'll, I was a little surprised to some degree at the lack of confidence that that Curry's displayed in Quinn Cook, especially with how well he played um, to close the season. So Cook you know, only averaging 17 minutes a game in the playoffs um, and not necessarily starting in, the, in, in any of those games. Uh, I was a little surprised by that. So they went with Iguodala instead, and I'll be interested to see if they make another adjustment when they play New Orleans. I would like to see Quinn Cook obviously get some more playing time. I think that he would bold well. I think he's a better ball handler, and I think the speed – is exactly what the Warriors are going to need in order to pick the tempo up a little bit more. Uh, you know, but then again, Shaw, it could be because Cook might not be as familiar with those sets that Kerr wants to see happen. And he may rely more on the fact that Iggy can do that, even though I think from a pace perspective, I think Quinn Cook is a far he, – he moves the ball a lot faster uh, up and down the court which I think is something that's going to be essential against Alvin Gentry. There's no way there's there's I'm going to rely on the idea that Alvin Gentry is a good enough coach and we're going to give him a little bit, you know, ahead of the curve because of the fact that he formerly was an assistant head coach for the Golden State Warriors. So yeah, we, you know, we keep saying, Oh yeah, he's familiar with the system. He knows Kerr and everything like that. This just comes down to the players on the basketball court. And ultimately if you're Steve Kerr and you know, that the best way to beat the Pelicans is to get that tempo up even faster. He wants guys that knows what they need to do and when to get into those sets and how to do that. I think that's part of the reason why he may rely on Iggy, but I would love to see him use Cook a lot more because I really think he could be more of an essential key factor in the series, kind of like one of those underlying X-Factor themes that we need to look for through the course of this series. 
Yeah, you know, I mean, Quinn, Quinn Cook has basically taken the place in some ways of, of Ian Clark, who is now on the New Orleans Pelicans, too. So, uh, you know, if, if you know, it would be interesting to see those two guys at, at some stage, like late in the second quarter type of situation, or early in the second quarter, probably, you know, where those two guys are trying to, you know, create offense for each, um, you know, for their respective teams and, you know, maybe stymieing the tide a little bit for, for, for their rosters. I mean, those are the battles in between battles that you look for in the playoffs and some of the cool stories that, that I think can come out of it. Again, no one's lining up to see Quinn Cook and Ian Clark in a shootout, so don't get me wrong. Um, but it's like those are the type of things that I look at sometimes. It's like, oh, you know, that three or four minute stretch, that was cool. The, both those teams needed that from those guys in their respective areas. Um, and I think both guys are capable if given the opportunity. Well, I think that's the bigger outlier, Shaw, because, you know, one of the things that we've often said that is, is a concern for the Golden State Warriors is the fact that their depth, as far as their team goes, is not the same type of depth that we've talked about um, in recent years. They, you know, this death by depth lineup that they've always had, it's, it's it to me, this is another indication that the Golden State Warriors are going to get by with the super, you know, uh, extraterrestrial talent that they possess. I mean, it's damn Thanos-like that this team is formed. They're like the Black Order of the damn NBA right now, right? And then you look at the Pelicans, and I, I, honest to God, Gentry is going to have to run Anthony Davis and Drew Holiday out there for 44 minutes if they have any hope of being able to maintain. Because if you're telling me that Gentry is going to rely on his bench to go out there and sustain what his starters are giving him, I, I will tell you right now that I'm going to plan to I'm planning to move to Montana because clearly the best weed must be out there for me to smoke. Yeah. Well, again, I think that's why I say that's why they're an X factor. They if they're able to compete and, and play at a higher level um, than they've shown thus far, you know, that's huge for them because th those horses cannot c continue to go up. You know, the stallions that the Golden State Warriors have on their roster because they can they can take you know, Kevin Durant out and still have Clay and, and Draymond out there. You know, and I think with with New Orleans, yeah, they take Davis out and Drew Holiday is it's good, and he was very good against uh, uh, Portland's defense. But Golden State is is different. You know, they're a different animal. And then especially when you rest guys, then they will have the opportunity to load up on you and make other guys beat you. Hence your your Ian Clark's, your Etwan Moore's, even your your Millers and your Hills. Um, so that's why I think the bench is going to be important for New Orleans if they're going to really make it a long series and not just be here for courtesy. Well, one thing is definitely certain. Alvin Gentry has definitely cemented himself in being the head coach for the foreseeable future with the New Orleans Pelicans. Because you, there's no way that you could have told me if, if, if Alvin Gentry was able to pull off the upset. And, we, and listen, this is exactly what it is. You don't have Boogie Cousins. You really don't have a legitimate bench. I even think going into this, if they did have Boogie Cousins— Unless we were gauging how well this basketball team played in the final stretch, I don't know if we would have been still talking about the New Orleans Pelicans advancing to the next round because we still just weren't able to buy into it all coming together. But the fact that they swept the Portland Trailblazers the way that they did and the way that Anthony Davis has dominated, you can make the argument that Alvin Gentry definitely needs to be the head coach for this team for the now. But it'll be really interesting to see how he coaches in this series, because I really do believe Steve Kerr is going to put it on Alvin Gentry that he needs to show every much as bit why he believes that he deserves to be the head coach of an NBA basketball team. Because you know how I've been, Shaw. I've always said that Gentry has been a great assistant head coach, but he's never cut it as a head coach. And he's really got some great pieces around him, and hopefully he'll get these guys inspired to play the kind of basketball that's above and beyond to make this a competitive series. But I really think that Kerr is going to force his hand for him in the way that he uses his roster, the way he pulls out Drew Holiday and Rajon Rondo and Anthony Davis, how he uses these guys interchangeably through the course of an NBA game and through the course of this series. Right. The substitution pattern is going to be key in addition to the rotations. And like I said, to, to begin the, to begin the segment, what does he do defensively? What schemes does he run to kind of slow down some of the offensive goal and state? Who does he target as guys who's like, I, they have to beat us. Or does Golden State just kind of, you know, run, uh, as you say, rough shot on them and, and and just get whatever they want with whoever they want? Um, so Gentry is going to have to earn his money. You know, there's no doubt about it. I think Draymond Green jokefully uh, kind of said, hey, you know what? He's no way he's going to outcoach out Steve Kerr. Um, but he's, you know, he's talking stuff um, about his former guy and Alvin Gentry. But I think he believes it, too. You know, while it's it's playful, um, there's a lot of seriousness and jests. 
And that's forget where you're right. Forget out coaching Steve Kerr. I mean, out coach the whole uh, Golden State Warriors. I mean, shoot, man. Steve Kerr gave the clipboard to his team one time. What makes him think that Algin Gentry is just coaching Steve Kerr? Yeah, coach the rest of that squad. And that that true that is true indeed. So what happens now? You know, who is and well, we'll say this. I'll parse that with this and saying that you know Rondo is our on the floor coach. Which, um, he is a, he is a, a court general, and I think he will see some things wait, wait, out wait, there wait, that wait. he will definitely let his guys know about. Which Rondo do you want to see on the basketball court, Shaw? Do you want to see the well composed, uh, well kept? Rajon playoff Rondo, or do you want to see the one that has that meme that's been passed around recently with his eyes jumping out the back of his skull, <laughs> back of his skull in the middle of a timeout type of Rondo? Um, the latter, only because I think it is going to take a little crazy for them to beat Golden State um, overall in this series. You're, you're going to need a, a special Herculean effort if you if you want to see that come to fruition. So you just can't be your regular self. So, you know what? Hey, go crazy. Go all the way crazy and try to get it done if you're no one's podcast. All right, Josh. So how do we see this play itself out? Who wins and uh, how many games? I do see a very, very competitive um, series, um, but I think it's going to be in that gentleman's sweep-ish type of type of scenario. I want to say six games for, for New Orleans. I just, I just can't do it, um, but I feel like it's going to be five very, very competitive, hard-fought games that has Golden State sweating everything out all the way. I got GSW in five. Yeah, I've got um, the GS dubs in in six. Um, I, I, I'm not saying that I'm sipping on the Kool-Aid. And I might even think that because of the fact that there's that that game four, five-ish scenario where the Pelicans may pull one, that it may, you know, be good enough, just enough time to have Steph Curry come in and play a game, but leading into a possible finals matchup or whoever comes out of the, uh, the other side of the bracket. So to me... I just think that the, the Pelicans are playing on a natural high. Usually that natural high doesn't wear off until somewhere in you know the mid part of the series. Uh, but there will be a reality check. It could be even a 1-1 series tie you know, because the Warriors are always good for giving up games that they're not supposed to be giving up. And while they have the home field advantage, at times they allow that to kind of get to their heads. So I see the Pelicans getting ousted in six by the Golden State Warriors. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. You know, it, it can really go, um, I think, one of those two ways. I think we'd both be surprised if it went to a seven-game series. And, it's, and it, I'm not selling New Orleans short at all. Like, I think they're a great basketball yeah, team. Yeah, to, it's to your things. point, like kind of like the Philadelphia 76ers and the Miami Heat. They're, they're going to show you signs of being the type of basketball team that should give the Golden State Warriors, you know, quips. Uh, but uh, essentially, this is what battle-tested championship teams do when facing some level of adversity, they, you know, get the, they, they get the smelling salt and then they wake the hell up in the second half and then they just go ahead and they, they handle their business. Yeah. And I, and right. I think Golden State is, is going to be prepared um, and understanding that they can't take this team lightly. Um, this isn't the Spurs, you know, this is a team that has high powered offense, um, a very good defense as well. And a, a true elite level superstar, all NBA talent in the form of Anthony Davis and a guy like Drew Holiday is playing great basketball right now, the best of his career. So I think you're going to get a very focused effort from Golden State. Um, I will say this, if, if Pelicans are able to somehow steal the first game of the series, then you have a very good chance that it goes six, maybe even seven per se. So I, I, although I don't want to disrespect Golden State now, I just don't see them running off four straight against that New Orleans team. Um, but if they get the first, Golden State gets the first one, New Orleans take the second second, second game, then I can see Golden State maybe closing out in five as I lose. Most definitely, man. This has been an awesome show. Great preview. Great talk all around, brother, man. Once again, laying down the hammer, bodying up the bags, brother. I, I mean, I might, I might give you my part of the business, man. You handling it so lovely. Uh, that's very kind of you to say, man. But couldn't do it without you, homie. And like I said, whoever... Who else would I be zipping them up with and then my dude, my brother from another mother out in Jersey, you know, with UCL again. It's been a great, great time. Great show as always. I can't wait to see who we're going to be zipping up on, on the next episode because uh, a couple more teams are mm, smelling like rigor mortis. So it's going to be about that time. <laughs> Hashtag him six feet deep, baby. Six <laughs> feet deep. Once again, we'd like to thank you and yours for tuning in. Be sure to get at my man, Shaw. Be sure to get at me. Be sure to get at the show at NBA Baseline. Let us know who you think might be walking in that second that semifinal round between the Warriors and the Dubs. For the Baseline, Cali, Warren Shaw, we appreciate you guys. You know we do. And we'll catch up with you next time. <laughs>